podcasting to you from the beautiful Pacific Northwest. I'm your host, Brad Johnson. Welcome to The Theory of Wine. In today's podcast, we talk with the wine trendsetter, a Wine Spectator Magazine's 40 Under 40 awardee, Walla Walla winemaker and owner, Ashley Trout of Brook and Bull Cellars and Vital Winery. We're going to talk about Walla Walla Wines, a nonprofit winery, and getting geeky with wine. Stick around. Support for this podcast comes from the new documentary film, Wine Diamonds, Uncorking America's Heartland, streaming now at WineDiamondsFilm.com and from WineryBoost.com, Influence Marketing for the Wine Industry. My guest today is Ashley Trout, the owner and winemaker of Brook and Bull Cellars and is her latest project in the Walla Walla Valley. Ashley began her winemaking career at 18, following her passions around the world in search for the best ways to combine a love of winemaking with a goal of community betterment. She spent the better part of a decade working harvest in Mendoza, Argentina, and has been an integral part of the Walla Walla Valley wine scene since 1999. Brook and Bull wines are handcrafted from the vine to bottle, made with small fruit lots sourced from carefully tended vineyards. From alcohol to acid, phenolics to tannin, balance is always her goal. Ashley also runs Vital Winery, a nonprofit winery with proceeds supporting the Walla Walla Valley Vineyard and Wineries workers, giving access to affordable health care. All profits go to the SOS Clinic, a free nonprofit health care clinic in Walla Walla area dedicated to helping people get the health care they both need and deserve with no questions asked. And Ashley Trout is a winemaker to watch, as she was recently recognized by Wine Spectator magazine as one of the 40 under 40 tastemakers of 2018. Ashley Trout. Welcome to the Theory of Wine. Thank you for having me. Well, I met you. I didn't really meet you. I, I'd heard about you um, during a conversation with, uh, with a friend of mine, Muriel Kenyon. She's uh, the uh, manager, uh, tasting room manager of Otis Kenyon Wines um, in Walla Walla, and they have a tasting room here in, Wa- in Woodenville. Um, and she told me your story, and I was like, oh, my God, this, she's so awesome already. I had never met you at that point. I, well, <laughs> this is our first meeting. And um, so I was, I was impressed before I even met you about your, your story and what you do locally with your nonprofit winery. And then I was at the Wine Bloggers Conference. Now it's called the Wine Media Conference um, in Walla Walla back in October. And I heard you on the panel discussion. And though I didn't, I didn't introduce myself because you were surrounded by adoring fans, I did make a <laughs> mental note that I wanted to chat with you sometime. And I'm really glad that you have a moment here to talk with me. So... Um, I'd just like to kind of jump in and say, what's your story? How'd you get to where you are today? Yeah. Um, I mean, really, right. It's, it's the classic example of right place, right time. I, at, at every single stage along the way, have not deserved the lucky breaks that I've gotten over and over and over again. Um, when, you, when you look at Walla Walla and the Washington State wine industry in general, the trajectory really took off starting in the early 2000s for everybody. Mm-hmm. And um, I think what you find, not not just with me, but um, with a lot of people in the Valley, if you look at um, Sean Boyd of Roti, you look at Cameron Contos of Contos Cellars, you look at Joe Forrest of Tempest. I mean, there were, there were a whole bunch of us um, and a lot of a lot of wines. A whole bunch of us mm-hmm. were the assistant winemakers, right. um, or even just the cellar rats at the at the moment. And we were all kind of in our twenties, mm-hmm. um, right when the industry needed twenty year olds. Quite right. frankly, because you you when everything's growing that quickly, what you need is not an expert. You need a go getter. You know, mm-hmm. you need somebody who's going to pack up UPS boxes. You need somebody who's not going to be afraid to look dumb learning how to drive a forklift you need somebody who doesn't who doesn't have spouses or kids or boyfriends or girlfriends and and it doesn't it doesn't matter to them whether it's a saturday or a sunday or tuesday they're there right right? um and and to this day i think if you look around a, a disproportionate number of us that that run wineries own wineries are winemakers we were sort of in our 20s during those stages Mm -hmm. um so it was it was really right place right time i remember when i got my first job uh at reininger winery which was september of 1999 i was 18 and um knew nothing 
about okay. wine and wasn't driven to learn a whole lot about wine. This was a goofy sounding job to me. It mm -hmm. was a part-time job that I stumbled across and, and the, the position was to mix up bins of wine late at night to do the nighttime punch downs. Sure. And uh, I, I just thought, well, that sounds ridiculous. You know, that sounds like a job I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to be doing when I'm 40. And of course, <laughs> it's exactly the job I'm going to be doing when I'm 40. Um, so yeah, that, that's what it was. And, and the reason I was hired was because I showed up. Mm -hmm. that was it. And now you look at the industry and it's, you've really got to know your stuff you know you've got the Walla Walla Community College is doing mm -hmm. a great job of pumping out very well educated uh wine makers and and cellar rats and lab techs and I mean these people really know what they're doing before they even get their first job mm -hmm. um, so it's a different industry altogether mm -hmm. uh and and I think the industry is benefiting greatly from having a really well studied workforce prior to that first position. We're really thankful to have that mm -hmm. community college program. And then also I think Washington State University is doing a great job as well. Sure. So you didn't you didn't begin and you didn't start your life in Walla Walla, did you? I think I read someplace that you were an East Coast person. Yeah, originally I'm from Washington DC. Okay. So how did you find your way out to Washington? <laughs> Uh, it was actually kind of calculated. I um, I figured there weren't jobs in small towns, and I, I grew up just a pinch in L.A., but mostly D.C. At any rate, I understood cities. I knew what that was about, mm -hmm. and I wanted to be in a small town at some point in my life, and so I figured college would be a good time to do that, and then I'd graduate and go to a city and get a real job. So, so that was it. I, I wound up finding... Uh, Whitman College. I wanted oh, a small school in a small gotcha. town, and I wanted to go out west. My whole family was from the East Coast, and most of the people I knew were going to stay on the East Coast. So, I headed out for an adventure. And Walla Walla I is, is is the place. So, I mean, what is it about Walla Walla that's special to you? I mean, I've I've been I, so I've driven through there. I lived in the Palouse. I've used to live in Moscow, Idaho, and now live in Seattle area. Um, but you know that that landscape there is it's it's different. It's 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 unexpected for people that have never traveled that part of the world. So tell us about Walla Walla and the, and the grape growing region and what it, what it is about that area that's is attractive to you. Yeah, you know, I think different, I think your your relationship with the town really is predicated on where you are in life when you arrive to it, right? And so what drew me to Walla Walla is certainly not what has kept me in Walla Walla, although I still very much appreciate it. I, I remember vividly walking around town as I was visiting uh, the college that I wound up going to, Whitman College, and I looked up and the and the street that I was on was clearly the, the main street in town. And sure enough, I look up and the street sign says Main Street. And for, uh, you know, so many of us that live out here in small towns out west, that's not shocking. For me, I just felt like I was suddenly in a movie it's mm -hmm. like the main streets called main street you know this, <laughs> this these are towns that actually exist right. um and so that was an experience that i wanted to have and that that very much holds true main you know main street is main street and the and the farmers are farm friendly and mm -hmm. the town is small and you you go to the gym and everybody's there you know i mean all the all right. the cliches are very much true in an, in an adorable way but the reason I've stayed in Walla Walla has been much more wine mm -hmm. centric uh, uh, than I had ever thought uh, it would be. Um, but I, I love Walla Walla, not just as a wine growing region in terms of the terroir, uh, the climate, the soil type, um, but a, another facet of it, it is that it's kind of, there's really a special moment right now where the door is open for so many of us to get in it's it's not cost prohibitive i mean it is it's very expensive but right. when you look at other wine growing regions it's not cost prohibitive comparatively uh to make your dream come true um so there's there's still that opportunity in a way that that opportunity does not exist in many parts of california or oregon for that matter um so that's that's really a special time and then because of that the kinds of people that come here um, they're dreamers, right. you know, they're risk takers, they're dreamers, they're, they're willing to roll with the roller coaster of nature to 
to do this thing. And so you've got a lot of adventurers um, who are, are really thinking outside of the box and are t- ready to take a gamble, are ready to work really hard to do it, are excited. I think it's one of the reasons why there's such great camaraderie mm-hmm. between what could be considered um, competitors. You know, you brought up Muriel Kenyon. She's mm-hmm. one of my, she's one of my good friends. Uh, I, she's great. She's mm-hmm. amazing. And um, and we're all like that. You know, we've all we're all good people, and we're all enjoying each other's company. And so, not only are we a great wine growing region, not only are we a, an adorable small town, but there's also this sense of group um, because we're all sort of like-minded crazy people, which is a lot of fun. <laughs> it is fun. You're the best people in the world. The winemakers are. So you, you were in Argentina. It looks like you and us all, I read something about your assistant winemaker spent some time down in Mendoza area in Argentina. Tell me about that. Yeah. So I, uh, I was working at Reininger winery for, for years and, um, and one harvest before harvest, I had a bad uh, rock climbing accident and I mm-hmm. broke a bunch of bones. Anyway, I missed harvest that year in the Northern Hemisphere. And I sort of got my battery back and functioning uh, around um, January, February. And so I thought, okay, well, why don't I go down to the Southern Hemisphere mm-hmm. and get a harvest in? I was sort of itching to be productive. Sure. Right. And um, so I started going down to Argentina. I was ra- raised bilingually, so the Spanish wasn't mm-hmm. a, a problem. And I just loved it, totally loved it. So I wound up working at Alta Vista, which is one of Michelle Rowan's wineries. I did mostly a lot of lab work there. I wound up working at um, Tamari, which is a, a Chilean-owned uh, winery in Argentina. I wound up doing a lot of work out of for my for myself for my own projects for flying trout back in the day, mm-hmm. out of the Don Bosco facility, which is the the master's program down there for enology. And so they have all these little little tanks, sort mm-hmm. of student tanks. And uh, one thing you find in Argentina is all the production's a lot bigger because mm-hmm. they're dealing with export. Uh, exporting wines and if you're going to export wines you really got to make it worth your while you know sure. um, so it's it's hard to find some of those smaller tank situations um, so anyway that's I just sort of bounced around between a few different facilities I did some quicker internships uh, at various places and and uh, it was a lot of fun it was a lot of fun it sounds, it sounds like an awesome experience um, I see that you know some of your early your early work was focused I think on Malbec is that where that kind of came from working down in Argentina that that passion for that maybe yeah absolutely that is where that came from cool so tell me tell me about the this the kind of the the story of your progression in terms of having different wineries I know you've you've had several of them in over the course. <laughs> so can you kind of take us back to the beginning and kind of walk us through today yeah, absolutely. So I was at Reininger for eight years, and um, the year before I left Reininger, Chuck Reininger was nice enough to let me get going on some of my own wine, and it, it became apparent um, to, to all of us that it, it was I was going to have to choose between one one or the other. There were mm-hmm. I could only be in so many places at once, and I wanted to do both his wine justice, which had always been important to me and my wine justice. And you, you know, at some point you've got to pick. So, um, I left to do flying trout exclusively. And so I was that flying trout was really, uh, uh, focused on Malbec and Malbec blends. Mm -hmm. That that was the the real focus. And then we did a Toronto out of Argentina as well, which was fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did flying trout in total for a decade. I, Mm -hmm. I owned it uh, for five years, sold it in 2010, stayed on as the winemaker for about five more years after that. I did take one year off to be with my kids. I had two kids under the age of three and that was, that was a lot. Um, sure. and then I got, got back on that horse and then, um, Vital and Brook and Bull had really been stuck in my head. You know, flying trout was so specific. It was Malbec and Malbec blends and I'm mm-hmm. thankful that it was, and I'm glad that I had that decade to to do that focus but uh you get kind of an itch to do some geekier projects Mm -hmm. every now and then and for and i certainly had the itch to do vital and do that um Mm -hmm. socially 
sort of social justice part of it. I th- right. I, for me personally, after after a while, you sort of wake up and I've been doing wine for 18 years and I just think, am I making the world a better place? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I'm, I love my job. I love creating things. I love cooking. I love art. I love the science. I love all those things, but it almost feels too good to be true. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a- am I... Am I doing good for others or am I just doing good for myself? And and um, and I love enriching other people's day mm-hmm. with wine, but I needed something a little bit deeper than that. Mm-hmm. So I, I really wanted to get Vital up and running. I'm, I'm curious. I know Vital is not a, just a you thing. It's a community thing. Can you tell me how, how that process unfolds of, you know, gathering, getting the, the, the fruit sourced and working together with other area growers and winemakers and the community of wine folk in Walla Walla? Yeah, it's funny you ask that because we've really come full circle. So originally when, when uh, my assistant winemaker and I, Tim Doyle, he and I were driving between vineyards. Vital didn't exist yet. It was, it was, um, we were just pitching around ideas. Mm-hmm. And the, the idea originally was we would have all these different winemakers make their Vital wine. And then somehow we would sort of bring it together and mm-hmm. take care of the sales and the organization. That was the original idea for Vital. And then before we got Vital going, it became clear that that was going to be sort of a structural mess. Mm-hmm. A legal mess, sure. a structural mess. It was going to be a lot to to wrap our brains around. And so we started Vital just with Tim and I making the wines and the grapes were all donated. So for Vital, uh, pretty much everything's donated. Grapes are all donated. Um, mm-hmm. Corks, capsules, bottles, labels, uh, the, all that stuff is, is donated in some capacity or another. Graphic design work, everything's donated. Wow. Um, and, and so we got, we got going with that and that was great. And that seemed like a formula that was working and pretty simple. You know, Mm -hmm. everything's donated. Tim and I make the wine. Done. Great. Done. Um, but what we found was, and this is heartwarming and this is telling of Walla Walla is that we just had so many winemakers, so many vineyard owners, so many, um, assistant winemakers, so many tasting room staff, so many people in Walla Walla that wanted to be a part of Vital in an even more thorough way. And so just recently, we've kind of gone back to the drawing board to see if we have the the mental and organizational bandwidth to sort of poke a stick at that first original idea. So we'll, we'll see if we branch it out a little bit more. We, I mean, it would be great to do that. We just want to do it in a way that doesn't mess up anything Mm -hmm. and so the money that is raised the proceeds from your the vital winery go to the sos clinic in in the walla walla area um that's pretty that's pretty amazing and so i guess recognizing the fact that there's a community need and then you all getting together and creating this thing is is pretty special so how do the folks at the sos clinic feel about this relationship well, it's funny. The SOS Clinic originally started as a Seventh Day Adventist group, which is a religion that does not drink. Mm-hmm. And yet, what they were finding was that a lot of the people they were seeing in their clinic were part of the wine industry. They were part of the vineyard industry, mm-hmm. and and it was it only made sense to sort of reach back out to the wineries and the vineyards and say, "Hey, we're we're seeing your people." Mm-hmm. Um, just just so you know. And whether there could be more of a collaboration or at the very least, whether, it, you know, health care, health insurance could be more on the radar for, mm-hmm. the, for the industries that, that the clinic was seeing the most. So they brought me onto the board as, as a branch to the wine industry. And, um, and I think the original idea was that they wanted me to go up to, to winemakers and winery owners and say, hey, can you give me two bottles mm-hmm. for an auction? Um, because we know that you're not providing health care for your workers. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to have that conversation like a hole in the head. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, these are all my best friends and right. coworkers and, you know, people who I go 
walk around the lake with. You know, these aren't people I want to. And yet, the reason healthcare is so hard to find within the within Washington State isn't because anybody's a bad guy. It's because when you look at the industry, um, so many wineries are very young mm-hmm. and broke. If you're if you're a young winery, that means you're a broke winery. Sure. It takes a lot of time to start making money uh, within the wine industry, and that's if you're acing it. Uh, that's best case scenario. Mm-hmm. So. Um, when you go hire people, you're not hiring full-time staff. Right. You're hiring part-time staff. You're hiring somebody to help me in the tasting room on a Saturday, or you're hiring somebody to be on the crush pad for three months out of the year. Um, but that's it. And and so it's very hard to provide health care for mm-hmm. somebody who works one day a week, right? Or for somebody who works three months out of the year. So that's the that's the problem that we're in. And And because everybody recognizes it and nobody's really at fault um when you dangle something like vital in front of them that's it's not perfect but we're at least getting somewhere everybody jumps on board so that's been heartwarming well absolutely that's what that's the word that was coming to my mind and that's what i that's what i thought when i first heard muriel talk about this operation and then heard you again talk about at the conference and it's like this is so important. I'm just curious, are there, are there other wineries like this around the country that you know of? Um, they're formatted a little bit differently. Uh, I know that One Hope out of California does some stuff like this. Um, there, there are a couple here and there. It's the Salud program, S-A-L-U-D, out mm-hmm. of the Willamette Valley, um, does a great job sending funds to the clinic. But the real difference between us and a lot of other wine growing regions is that we're pretty far from a city and Mm -hmm. if you're far from a city the reality of throwing one big auction weekend where a whole bunch of cool rich kids show up and outbid each other and you Mm -hmm. make two million dollars in a weekend you know that just doesn't happen when you're this far removed from people right so we needed to structure this idea in in a different way than they've been able to structure salute i mean if i could do salute i'd do salute but i i can't we can't here so we needed to sort of think outside of the box a little bit cool well it's it's an incredible idea and i'm I'm so happy for your community and i'm I'm, must be heartwarming to be part of it We'll be back in a moment with a final half of our interview with Ashley Trout of Brook and Bull Cellars and Vital Winery and one of Wine Spectator Magazine's 40 Under 40 Tastemakers of 2018. Hey, wine friends. Each week, the Theory of Wine will bring you interesting content from winemakers, wine growers, wine rebels, writers and bloggers, and serious wine nerds from around the world. Want to join us? Connect with us at theoryofwine.com, on Facebook, or Twitter. Cheers, friends. Welcome back to the second half of our interview with Ashley Trout of Brook and Bull Cellars and Vital Winery and one of Wine Spectator Magazine's 40 Under 40 Tastemakers of 2018 as she talks about her wineries, her 2018 rosé, and the outlook for the Walla Walla Valley wine region. Um, I, I want to circle back to uh, the Flying Trout end of those days and Malbec, and you said you wanted to geek out with some wines, and so you created Brook and Bull Cellars, and tell me about the wine geeky wines you're making now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so for Brook and Bull, what we're really focused on is high-end, small lot, low oak profile varietals. Mm-hmm. And we, we do a couple of fun blends, which you know, we get our kicks on. But um, the real focus is, um, and, and a lot of these varietals are pretty hard to find just at all. We do a straight up Petit Verdot. We do a straight up Cap Franc. Um, we do a high a high end small lot Malbec, which you don't see very often. Usually, Malbec has this stigma of being a, a cheap wine because a lot of Malbec comes out of a third world country. For sure. Um, but but there's some really luscious Malbec to be made out there. Um, so we do the um, we geek out in that way, and mm-hmm. we do such small lots that, um, for example, our our Cab Franc that usually sells out within two or three weeks of release 
is like a really Kem Franke Kem Franke. Mm-hmm. We don't sh- we don't shy away from the part of Kem Frank that freaks people out. Uh, we we go for it. We shoot nice. the <laughs> uh, and and kind of same with the Petit Verdot. We we tone down the tannins on the Petit Verdot to the best to the best of our abilities, but we let that beast be the be the beast that it is. So nice. it's kind of fun to showcase those varietals in a, in a way that's not masked by a bunch of new oak, but mm-hmm. is done at a very high, thoughtful, hands-on level. And I, and I don't mean hands-on in, in that we that we mess with it a whole sure. bunch. If I, I mean it in the sense that if you're paying attention at all of the stages that are really important, then you don't need to mess with it, right? You catch right. it. You catch it when you need to catch it on certain things, whether it's too much oxygen or the fermentation's too hot, or mm-hmm. you know whatever it is. The, those right. simple tweaks. If you're really nailing it, then you don't have to mask it with oak, and you don't have to mess with it later on. Well, that's that kind of kind of falls into the a question of your winemaking philosophy. I mean, do you have kind of a, your elevator speech for your winemaking philosophy, or did you just say it? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of just said it, you know, right. it's, um, the, the goal, uh, I think, I think the goal for a lot of winemakers is um, to make the best wine you can that's got the best balance and the most gorgeous phenolics, the most gorgeous smells and tastes without having to fix it, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, uh, and I think so often... A lot of us get there and we think they were there, we're there, but then we second guess ourselves mm-hmm. and we sort of play around with oak more than we need to, or we mm-hmm. sort of mess with it more than we need to. So, um, timing is a big part of my winemaking philosophy, sort of mm-hmm. focus on the, on the right timing. And then that sort of fixes itself later on. So how is your winemaking, your, your own personal winemaking kind of evolved over the, your lifetime of making wine? This is my double down year. I started when I was 18 and now I'm 37. So this is, I've now been making wine more than half my life. Um, yeah, I, the, the clear difference between the early days, mm-hmm. uh, there were sort of, there, there have been sort of three stages. The first stage was I wasn't in charge. You know, the mm-hmm. first stage was I was for years and years um, under the tutelage of not only Trek Reininger, but all the guys I worked for in Argentina and also just the industry in general teaches you things Um, and harvest in general teaches you things. Mm -hmm. Um, I would, I would argue you're never fully, I I know you did some work in in a cellar. You've Mm -hmm. seen it. You've seen it in person. You're never fully in charge when nature is in fault mm-hmm. but um to the capacity that i had creative control I, the first third of it i didn't um so that was one stage and then another stage when i was doing flying trout was i really wanted um i really wanted to do this micro focus mm-hmm. on uh on one varietal and and really nail it mm-hmm. really know it really speak that language um, no matter how smart you are or how much winemaking you do or how, how much hard work you put in, you're never going to be an expert on all varietals, right? right? Uh, they're just too many. It's unrealistic. And they all act differently. They all have their own personalities, not only their own taste at the end of the day, but they have their own personalities in the fermentation bin. Right. They have their own personalities in how they react to oak. They have their own personalities in how they react to yeast. Mm-hmm. So you're never gonna, you're never gonna speak all of those languages. Um, so flying trout was very much uh, my my Malbec uh, master's program, if mm-hmm. you will, sure, sure. and that was exciting. And then the 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 third that I'm in now is um, being able to have a little more fun with with myself and with grapes at large, and and um, being able to say yes to a really geeky Camp Franc or geeky Petit Verdot or, or, you know, branch out into the Chardonnay world, which has been fun. And quite frankly, my geek fest of, of last year and the year before was Rosé. Oh. What people don't realize is that Rosé is probably the hardest mm. wine to make. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, you know, people don't think it is because it's got a low price point, but mm-hmm. it's hard. Right. Um, 
and it's kind of it's a fun challenge um with rosé you've got to make it heat stable or it'll mm -hmm. go cloudy you've got to make it cold stable or it'll throw potassium bitartrate crystals and reds mm -hmm. will do that too but you don't know it right. right as a consumer you don't know if a red's heat stable or not and you don't care it's opaque and you drink it right um so with the rosé you you have to think about those things and then you definitely don't have oak as an option mm -hmm. you don't have I mean, generally, you don't have other barrels or tanks of rosé in your cellar to blend with in case you don't love the mm -hmm. first rosé that you made. I mean, generally, you make the one rosé that you make, and and that's it. Mm -hmm. And so you, you don't have blending as an option for fixing things. And you've got to nail the acidity because if you don't, uh, a rosé without the proper amount of acid is depressing Absolutely. so it's kind of like, it's kind of like a, a caprese salad there are fewer ingredients and you've got to nail every single one of them they're all naked mm -hmm. um so that's i'm not sure that's really your question you asked me more broadly about winemaking philosophy but I, I would say i'm just sort of geeking out on certain things no i think this, this, no this is perfect i love it so did you make a do you, are you making a rosé right now from 2018 Yep, we actually just tasted through the roses yesterday, um, and the uh, and the whites yesterday. So we're we're very happy with all of them, and it's it's fun to see. We did a we did like a yeast trial on mm -hmm. on one rosé versus the other. It was the same rosé, sure, sure. Uh, and the only difference was the yeast trial. And what what was so interesting was there's a slight color variation, mm. um, which you wouldn't you wouldn't think would happen, but what happened was we had a different temperature on the fermentation from one yeast to the other and that wound up hmm. affecting the interesting right it, isn't that interesting it, it's totally you would fun. never notice that slight variation on a yeah. red wine I, you know early in my winemaking career i thought oh, yeast it's like a yeast is a yeast is a yeast and the more i'm in it's like oh my god there's so many small little factors that really add up to what this wine is going to become it's just, it just makes me crazy but excited about it oh it's incredible so uh, for this this coming rosé is, is it from the same berries or are you using different different grapes or how, how do you how do you go about doing your rosé if you don't mind sharing yeah um so for our brick and bull rosé we kind of stick with the um sort of a gsm format mm -hmm. grenache syrah morved is is mm -hmm. generally the region that we wind up playing around in um and uh and we play around with some Cinso and Cunois as well. Um, the Cinso is really fun, but mm -hmm. it's it, it's a problematic child in that it doesn't help you with your color at all. I mean, mm -hmm. Cinso will press out clear, mm -hmm. essentially, but it'll give you these great aromatics. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's it's nice to have the blend of get some color in there. You get some mm -hmm. aromatics out of the Cinso. More bed gives you great aromatics. Grenache too. I don't know. It's that's the, that's what we're doing for Brook and Bull. And then for Vital, it's kind of a goofy, fun, exciting adventure because all the fruit's donated and we get the donation season varies from year to year. So sure. I don't I don't have a consistent this year. We we're doing um, predominantly Sangiovese out of the Seven Hills Vineyard is what mm -hmm. our our rosé is going to have. It's it's for yeah. the past three years. It's included that. And this year it's going to be real. Um, that's going to be the majority of it. That's awesome. Um, kind of maybe a, f a final question here. What's the future of the Walla Walla Valley wines? And I mean, if you had to you know, look in your crystal ball and kind of imagine what it's going to be in 10, 15, 20, 30 years, um, where's it going and how do people find you? So I, I had dinner with a whole bunch of people um, who are based out of Napa in the wine industry last night here in Walla Walla. And uh, one of the ladies said, to me i hope you're ready because this thing is not only going to blow up here but it's going to do so so much faster than california ever did or than oregon ever did the wines are amazing the price points are amazing the land is expansive uh the growing opportunities are crazy uh in a in a good way and furthermore you've got the internet uh, which when California was growing, it did not. When Oregon as a wine region was growing, it did not. And so everything moves at such a faster pace right now um, that it, it's sort of game on, right? Um, and I, I think the, the mitigated 
the mitigating factor is that we are so far from a city mm -hmm. that I'm not sure we'll ever land as as the next Napa or even as the next Willamette Valley in the sense that those are both within an hour of a major city and we simply are not. Right. Um, and there's a, a convenience involved with that that you can't replicate, you can't uh, replace. And um, and so I'm not sure we'll ever land there, but I do think the growth to whatever future Walla Walla is going to be is is going to be a quicker growth than what a lot of those guys went through. Um, so I think the key is going to be um, not having the bravado uh, and the ego to think that we know what's going on uh, and instead to look around and and learn lessons from Oregon learn lessons from California um, you know with the good comes the bad with the bad comes the good um, and so to just try to learn from history even though it's not our history there there are a lot of similarities um, and I think if we really focus on doing that we certainly have as far as a, a community um the right starting point the I, I would say um norm mckibben and um the the figgins family and um the, just across the board all those guys that helped start the valley rick small uh, marty club they are good people mm -hmm. they're really good people and so when you come in after the fact and you're a punk it's it shows and and i think that sort of company culture that inertia that we started with um that's huge right. and so we'll never be able to repay those guys enough for sort of starting us at that upper tier of grace if you will mm -hmm. um but you know as far as as wine growing goes and and the land it's going to be really exciting and people are going to make mistakes they're going to plant the wrong thing in the right place mm -hmm. um but um i don't know it's it's going to be exciting absolutely it's you know walla walla for those that have never been there before is a beautiful little town um, it just feels like home and it's got my favorite restaurant, my favorite breakfast restaurant. Um, I think it's called bacon and eggs and I love bacon and eggs. Yeah. So I totally recommend Walla Walla, the wines, the people, it's just a wonderful place. Ashley Trout, thank you so much for hanging out with us today on Theory of Wine. Detroit. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Ashley Trout's the owner and winemaker of Brook and Bull Cellars and Vital Winery located in Walla Walla Valley of Washington State. Want to know more about Brook and, Brook and Bull Cellars or Vital Winery? Check out their websites, Brook and Bull, that's B R O O K A N D B U L L dot com, and Vital Winery, that's V I T A L Winery dot com. I'll post links to our websites and contact information on my theory of wine dot com blog. Thanks a lot, Ashley. Thanks, Brad. Hey, wine friends. Thanks for hanging out with us for Theory of Wine podcast, brought to you by a new wine documentary called Wine Diamonds, Uncorking America's Heartland, now available online at winediamondsfilm.com and winerybooze.com, influence marketing for the wine industry. Thanks for listening, downloading, and sharing us. Find us at theoryofwine.com. See you next time. Cheers, friends.